and he started the recorder. Okay. We are here today with Betty Kent in the Pioneer's Home in Prescott, Arizona to hear her stories of her life in the Verde Valley, growing up um, in Flagstaff, and whatever she wants to talk about. Thank you, Betty, for doing this. Thank you for coming. Yes. All right, would you like to start with uh, your family, how they came to the Verde Valley? When I, I was fortunate, <clears throat> my uh, grandfather liked to talk and he told me the stories of their trip. I have read the history of it since and everything he told me came out very well verified. Um, when he was eight years old, well, let me start before that. My grandfather, Samuel Cotton Dickinson, was, uh, great-grandfather, was in Missouri, and he was married, had a wife and several children, and he went to the gold rush in California. It got in on the big to-do, mm -hmm. and he made $6,000. Okay. In those days, that was equivalent to a million now and he didn't want to come back across the plains the way he had come, gone over, so he took a trip around the Horn. They didn't, of course, have the Panama Canal, and back to New York and cross-country home. His wife died and he married her cousin and proceeded to produce a bunch more kids. So they had quite a big family before uh, they moved. My grandfather, there were four boys, and I think three girls, but there could have been four. I haven't done enough digging there yet. And uh, he brought two sons from his previous marriage. He was wagon master or guide or however you want to call it. And um, he had talked so much about the country he had seen that following the Civil War and disrest and things that happened, uh, Parson Bristow put together his congregation and several others and started West. And that was in 17, uh, 1875. My grandfather was eight years old at that time and he said that the movies showing the kids peeking out of the Conestogas was a big fib because a child's 50 pounds was a sack of flour they could walk. Oh. And most of the children walked. There was a net across the back of the wagon and while they were walking they picked up dried manure of cows and buffalo or anything and or sticks, leaves, twigs to make the fire that evening. And they, uh, I, I understand, I, I don't know, but uh, I understand that 10 to 15 miles a day was a pretty good trip for a large group being pulled by wagon cows. 20 miles was a really good day. So you can imagine that these kids really weren't mistreated. Most kids walked more than 20 miles in any day. And Granddad said they ran a lot and they went back and forth up and down the wagons. The women drove the wagon and small children sat on the bench with them. The men rode horseback. And uh, he told me that crossing the muddy rivers when they were up was the worst thing they did. They had some mule pulled wagons. He had two wagons coming. Uh, his two sons by previous marriage brought one wagon and his new wife and baby brought the second wagon. And uh, <clears throat> I understand that the first two 
were either horse or mule pulled. And uh, he said that when they reached these wagons, they would undo the, the they would put the mule pulled wagons up first, and they would swim the mules across and leave the wagons on the other side, or the horses. And when they got them over there, harnessed, they would swim back, carrying a rope. And they would use this rope to take a chain, and they would take the oxen and hook the chain. There was an iron loop on the front of the tongue, and they would hook the chain into that, and then over to the oxen, up the horses. And the, the, then they would put the oxen across, and when they were swimming, the team would hold against the current. He said sometimes they were almost swimming upstream to get across. <clears throat> and uh, those of us who've seen flash floods know what were, that must have been like. Mm. And he said that each wagon, they'd add the, they got that wagon across, they'd unhitch those oxen and put them behind the mules or horses and then hitch the next wagon. And uh, <clears throat> Crossing was not only tedious, it was dangerous. Yes. And getting the kids across meant carrying them either horseback or on the wagon, which they really were better off being carried. And uh, he said they had no hostiles, trouble. They saw people once in a while, but they didn't have trouble. According to Pastor Bristow's, he has a mem, um, memoirs at the Camp Verde Historical Society, and I have a copy. And he was the hero. <laughs> I mean, you know. <clears throat> and uh, what he tells primarily is whether you were Confederate or Yankee, the, the, he wore the blue. He was a good man. Ooh. And well, he wore the gray, but he turned out to be a real nice fellow. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, they arrived here, and the Chavez Trail, they came down at Beaverhead Flat. And the Chavez Trail that they came off, Granddad said they used trees. They took a, the chain again and put it to a log behind each wagon and the men took uh, pry poles, uh, and there's a word for it, the uh, long wool metal poles, um, I'll think of it. Anyway, they took those and blocked this, three or four of them would block this log right against the wagon and then let the animals pull the wagon to the extent of the train. Then they would set all brakes, put all men against holding the wagon while they moved the log up. Hmm. It was that steep. And then they got down to the, there was a kind of a way station on Beaverhead Flats and uh, went on down to the Verde. Their first stop was at Montezuma Well. And um, they, uh, from there, they branched out. They had a tree in McGuireville they called the marrying tree. And the people who'd <clears throat> met and courted on the trip over or who had known each other and finally this made a decision to team up, were married under that tree before they split. Uh, Granddad Samuel went to Cornville area. Okay. And he became the first 
acting postmaster. He was not the first appointed. And he drove the first mail stage from <laughs> Beaverhead Flat to Whipple. Wow. Huh. So that was quite a, you know. And um, after that, his older sons helped also drive that. And uh, my grandmother's people, the Vendarans, went up um, the Oregon Trail, and when they got up there, they decided that the weather was cold and snowy, and um, Godfrey decided to come to the Verde, or to Arizona, and he came to the Verde, and on the trip down, his daughter, Ida May, my grandmother, was born. Hmm. And it's, they always say, she was born in such and such California. Well, bullcrap, pardon me. They didn't know for sure where they were. <laughs> and they didn't know where the lines were either. They just assume they were somewhere in that vicinity. And, uh, she grew up, he, he built a house on the Verde in Cottonwood and uh, she grew up there. It's right behind, well it's where the WDR Ranch headquarters are now. They bought the house and it burned down. But anyway, uh, Granddad Godfrey settled on Oak Creek and uh, trying to think, I don't know who owns it now, but it was in the bend where the uh, swinging bridge is. Do you know where that is? Um, the swinging bridge, well, the one I'm thinking of is by TAPCO, it's not that one. No. By where? TAPCO. Oh, no, no, no that's no. on the that's, Verde. That's on the Verde, yeah. Oh, I don't know where the swinging bridge is. Well, just down from the Red Schoolhouse. Oh, okay, in Cornville. In Cornville, they had a swinging bridge across Oak Creek. Okay. And Granddad's family settled on the land on the Cornville side of the river, of the creek. And he courted my grandmother from there. And one of the stories grandmother told me. Now you do have to understand, ladies in that day did not ride stride. Did not ride? A stride. Oh, okay. No. She, right, so. she said that her riding skirt had to be four inches beneath her heel. So when she got on the horse and put her knee around the saddle horn, the upper horn, it covered her ankle. <laughs> and <clears throat> she rode side saddle. She never rode stride. And uh, she uh, had a horse that she trained that would lie down for her when she was out away from places. And she would, it would roll up, she'd sit on it, and it'd get up, and she would be mounted. <laughs> and uh, while he was courting, the grass across there, and if you drive there now, it's bare. But she said her horse lying down was well shielded. You couldn't see him. Mm -hmm. So the grass had to be quite tall. And uh, she would make her horse lie down and hide to where her bow would come riding up. And he was always riding young horses and she would wait till he was fairly close and jump up and the horse would buck. <laughs> she said it was such a thrill to see him ride him. <laughs> he was such a good rider. <laughs> and then she, they would mount and go on into her home, where of course they always visited at home a lot. And um, uh, they, uh, the two families, the Dickinsons and the Vendarans, were both highly populated. The Vendarans claimed pound for pound to outweigh any family in the Verde Valley, and the Wingfields took the challenge. 
<laughs> in camp in the in camp camp 30. and uh, Mrs. Wingfield at that time was quite irate that somebody thought there were more of pounds of Van Deren than there were pounds <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, grandmother went to school there. Grandmother and grandfather married and they moved to Camp Verde. My, her first three sons, uh, Rollo, who was called Don, Ralph, and my dad, Walter, were all born in Camp Verde. Okay. Then granddad moved north and ended up in Flagstaff where he was he settled and stayed until he was quite old. They returned and he died in uh, Jerome Hospital. Mm. Grandmother. The funny part, the really, well, I say funny, uh, unusual part, um, where Denny's restaurant is now in Cottonwood was where Grandma and Grandpa bought their last house. Hmm. It's where grandmother, Grandfather left to die and Grandmother moved in with her sister in Cottonwood. But down the road from Denny's is grandmother's first home hmm. in the Verde Valley. It isn't over a mile and a half. Hmm. So she made a circle and came back in her old age. Huh. And they lived in Guarville a little while, and they lived in, uh, well, actually at one time, granddad owned a store at Foxboro before Foxboro was the Foxes. <coughs> He had a little grocery store there. But uh, the whole family is so, I still don't know all my cousins. Hmm. I'm working on that now, but I still have no idea. And down to the third generation, uh, I walked into a store and I signed my name, Betty Dickinson Cant as I do on my checks, and this gentleman looked at me and he said, which Dickinsons are you, the new or the old? And I said, I'm the old. He said, and what was your dad's name? And I told him, Walter, and he said, oh, hi, cuz, I'm a Van Deren. Oh, for goodness <laughs> sakes. That wasn't his name, but that he was, his mother had been. So this is what I ran into my entire life in the whole Verde Valley, including Clarkdale, not Jerome. Jerome we didn't intermarry into, not at that time. My, my high school class was one of the first who interdated with the Jerome people. They were very um, secluded in their way. They were miners, we were farmers and their lifestyles were different. And, uh, but there were always a few, but it wasn't heavily done until my, I think my graduating class, which was the largest graduating class ever to leave Clarkdale High School. We had 42. Wow. <laughs> and we were champion football team and we were champion uh, drum and bugle corps with our choir master had gone and uh, got to Disney and we were the wolves and he had permission to put the big bad wolf on our bass drum and our girls were all dressed in maroon and white skirts so many inches from the ground which we had little Melba, Melba Shockley, who was quite short, which made it a very short skirt. <laughs> she was very worried about it. <laughs> and uh, at that time, 90% uh, of the kids from Cornville, well, no, Bridgeport, and uh, some Cornville. We had a lot of Cornville kids too. The, Gurdners and those came in, all went to Clarkdale High School. 
So no wonder we had the Lord just graduating class. Mm -hmm. How did you get to Clarkdale when oh, you were yes, in school? school bus. You had a bus, okay. Oh, absolutely. We were uptown. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, they, had, they did run a bus, I believe, also from the Sedona area. Wow. And uh, Clarkdale was, uh, was a funny little town then, with upper town bosses quarters and lower town workers. And uh, the, the, there was no, this is something that's so hard to say, to, to make people understand now. I had one class in school from the time I was four or five years old till I graduated. That was at one segregated group. Hmm. Uh, it, we, the Mexican and uh, Indian and Anglos all played on the same team. Uh, the Ital one of the Italian boys, who sat in the Mexican side, uh, was our class president. And when Mr. Summers, who was our ninth grade teacher, segregated us, we didn't understand it at all. It hmm. was, he claimed it was because this part took algebra and this part didn't. Mm -hmm. But we had some on this side that took algebra too. Mm -hmm. But uh, he was from back east. He can be forgiven, <laughs> barely. <laughs> and uh, uh, when I was born, my mother's family, mother was born in Salem Springs, Arkansas. And her father was a Cherokee, Pierpin. And her mother was a descendant of the long line that came from the Blessed Woman. Her maiden name was England. And uh, she was a mixture of Scott, English, and Cherokee. So my mother turns out to be almost a little more than half well, quite a bit more than half, Charlie blood. But my grandmother, Johnny, um, let's see, let's start back to Matilda. Matilda was my great-grandmother, Matilda May, England, R Randolph Anderson, and she died here at the Pioneer Home. Oh. Hmm. I visited her here prior to her death. And she had several children with Mr. Uh, Randolph. He was a landowner, a mason, uh, the whole bit in Arkansas. And what was his last name? Randolph. Randolph. John Randolph. Lord G, honey. Oh, Rand Randolph. R-A-N-D-O-L-P-H. Oh, okay. And, uh, okay. Uh, as she said to me, well, I did marry down when I married Anderson. <laughs> but um, mother, mother, mother's mother was named Johnny. She was grandmother and grandfather's great grandmother's third child, and that was she had no middle name, just Johnny. Hmm. And uh, she married George Washington Smith. The, Cherokee man, and had two children, my mother and her older brother, Floyd. They were born in Arkansas and came out here. And they arrived in the Verde somewhere in the vicinity of five or six, 19, five or six. And uh, mother said her first, their first night was spent with the Benedicts, at Benedicts Farm, which is now Hauser's. Oh. And uh, uh, grandfather 
George was a top-notch cowboy and a drunkard. And he, Jess Goddard told me that Granddad on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday was probably the top hand. And Monday he was hung over. Oh. <laughs> And one day when he was angry at me, he said, do you know who your great grandfather was? And I said, yeah, why? Well, he was a damn drunk Indian. <laughs> I said, yeah, I knew that. <laughs> anyway, he pushed it one day too far. And back in the days when divorce was a no-no, Grandma Johnny met him at the gate, told him, you're out of here and she divorced him. She then married into the Reed family. She married Uriah about a year later, and they had one son, Guy Reed. And Guy traveled all over this world as a road builder. <laughs> He's quite famous for it. And uh, he's my mother's half-brother, my uncle. And uh, uh, mother grew up around the Verde River somewhere, up and down there. She went to school at uh, Beaver Creek, she went to school at Cherry, she went to school at Strawberry. So I imagine before the divorce, they, wherever he, drank too much they could candy him and he went and got another job. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, I'm assuming. And uh, uh, Grandmother Johnny died when Mother was 13. So I never knew her. I never knew any of my mother's family except my uncle. Oh, and my Uncle Floyd, I knew before he died. I loved him dearly. Um, until I was 82 years old and went to Arkansas and met my mother's youngest half-sister, who was at that time 57. My grandfather had married three times, and this was his youngest final child. And I learned some of the family history from her. I visited her for a, couple, a week, and uh, I have some of that, but I'm still putting it together. And um, mother, when her mother died, went to Phoenix, and she at 13, and she. Uh, apparently took a job by the time she was 14. <laughs> and she was a telephone operator. And not only that, she was a raving beauty. She was Miss Chandler. <laughs> and uh, somewhere along the way, she moved to Prescott. And I have a clipping that says, Opal Smith is a bride. She was well enough known here that when she surprisingly married Walter Dickinson from Flagstaff, whose family owned at that time a good third of Flagstaff, it was quite a, we didn't even know they knew each other sort of a thing, <laughs> you know? Uh -huh. She had one child that died, and then I was born. In Flagstaff. In Flagstaff. And in my memoirs, I was a breech birth. I sat come late, back Ashford, and crippled. So that made a good start. Oh. I had a bad leg. Oh. Uh, this leg turned out this way. And the doctor said, we're going to put her in a cast. And my mother said, no, you're not. She'll learn to walk. He said, she can't. Oh, yes, she can. And I was never in a cast. 
the legs given me some problems during my life. For a while it would lock up on me, but I walk around pretty good. I covered a lot of steps. Hmm. And uh, when I was just over two years old, she and my dad divorced. And uh, between three and five, two years, I was with her primarily. I spent a little time with my uh, paternal grandmother and grandfather at the Pine Hotel in Flagstaff. He had it at that time. And uh, when I went to school in the fifth group, when I was five, they took me up to Emerson School and enrolled me. And at that time, uh, NAU was Flagstaff. Teachers College, mm -hmm. and my aunt and uncle both attended. Well, they were learning all this stuff on how to teach kids, and I was a kid, so I got the benefit of their schooling. By the time I was five years old and ready for school, I had a book. It was a 11 and a half by 9, like a piece of typing paper, of about four inches thick of the nursery rhymes. And I either knew them or could read every one of them. <laughs> wow. And uh, so they sent me to kindergarten with the, if you know something, you raise your hand and tell the teacher. Okay. Now, what is this color? Does anyone in the class know what color this is? That's red. Uh, now, do you know, it's that, you know, uh -huh. they told me to, uh -huh. and like a dead gum idiot, I did what I was told. And about a week of that, I got kicked out. <laughs> I'm the only person I know that really got kicked out again. <laughs> <laughs> they sent me home, and I spent another year being tutored by my aunt and uncle, or that kindergarten year. So that summer, of course, I went with mother, and then come fall, I was back at the Pine Hotel, back at Emerson School, and I did the first grade, and I had no trouble. I had, in fact, I didn't, didn't even know I was in school half the time. And then when uh, I spent the summers with mother again, and then when I was uh, in the second grade, I went back to school and I spent about two weeks in the second grade. And Miss Kenzie, who was the principal, came in and said to clean out your desk. I'm being kicked out again. I don't know what I've done wrong, but that was what happened to me the first time. So I clean out my desk. She come with me. And Laura Kenzie walked down that hall, and I don't. I hope I never have to walk the last mile, <laughs> but it keeps only a half mile in comparison. And we walked into the other room, and she didn't tell me who the teacher was. She just said, "Here she is. Good luck," and walked out. Well, I went through the third grade with no problem, and. Uh, that year, when I was six, my mother and I visited my Uncle Floyd and his wife, Aunt Patty, who had been a Burkett, um, and he was an assistant ranger at Long Valley. I was, went to my first forest fire, one lone tree burning with him. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, I have wonderful memories. The uh, Underwood family were the uh, head rangers. They had three children. I met the youngest daughter again here in Prescott. Uh, but I do remember Alice and Paul. And uh, we played together. I had a playmate. 
you know, at the hotel, I didn't have many playmates. My best playmate was our maid's daughter, Rosa, and our um, laundry ladies, or laundry company's uh, daughter, Margaret June Wong. Margaret who? Yeah, Margaret June Wong. Wong? Yeah, okay. Chinese laundry. Yeah, oh, okay. She was a wonderful girl, and I never did her full justice. And uh, I met her again when I was a senior, and I was embarrassed because I didn't know how to introduce her family to my family, my friends. Uh, but she she was, I remember her with, oh, I had another friend when I was in Flagstaff, Mary Jo Eaton. Her mother and dad ran a little restaurant next door to the Pine Hotel. It was a pie and coffee type place. Actually, it was a diner, but you know. And she sang on Flagstaff radio. Hmm. She sang Betty Boo. <laughs> And uh, so I knew I had a few, I'd had a few friends, but they had been few compared to most kids who play on the playground and stuff. But um, mother remet. Oh. Hold it. Let me. Hello. Mother had re-met a man by the name of Logan Lee Langdon. Nobody ever called him Logan but one time in my whole life. That was Bum Langdon. And Bum and Mother started dating. And uh, we were staying with Uncle Floyd and one day Mr. Langdon walked in and sat me on a chair. He said, I need to talk to you. And I said, what about? <laughs> and he said, I have proposed to your mother and she has agreed to marry me. I want to marry you too. I want you to be my daughter. <laughs> I said, oh. He said, I will do the best I can to be a good father to you. I said, okay, all right. So mother and I married him. <laughs> <laughs> the wedding day was something I have even written about. Uncle Floyd and Daddy Bum got in the front seat of a old fashioned touring car. Mother and Aunt Hattie and I were in the back and we started for Prescott. They were married in Prescott. And we get went down blue grade, and as we're going down blue grade, there's a herd of cattle going down the hill. Well, both Daddy Bum and Uncle Floyd had punch cows, and they knew that that wasn't something you can just go through. So we followed them all the way down blue grade. And we got to the bottom of the hill. They didn't move aside when there was room to let us go through. And Uncle Floyd, beaked his horn a little bit and did this. And the guy in back looked at him and they didn't throw birds in those days, but he would have had he had they done it. He just and kept the cattle right in the middle of the road. Well, Uncle Floyd, he was not a big man. He his uh probably between five eleven and six one somewhere, but he was built like he should have been, and uh, he let the car roll up and bump this man's horse hocks, and the horse bucked. The guy rode in, but he got off and he come back, rolling up his sleeves and cussing like a blue streak. And Uncle Floyd said, we have ladies in the car, and it would be better if you don't use that language. And uh, he said, well, blank, blank, they're ladies, you know. And he said, uh, 
I don't know who you think you are. Well, the men were both dressed in suits going to a wedding. The ladies were dressed up going to a wedding. Apparently, he thought he had a carload of dudes. <laughs> and Uncle Floyd looked at him and he said, well, I guess you will have it. And he unbuttoned his shirt sleeve and turned his white sleeve up and there's his brown, well-muscled arm. And he turns the second one up, and this guy looks, and he looks up and says, move the cattle over, boys, move the cattle over. <laughs> and they moved the cattle over, and we went on. I spent that night on the Benedict Farm at Grandpa Reed's and his second wife, Grandma Emma's house. They left me, well, I didn't spend the night, I spent that day. They left me there while they went to get married. So I repeated history to a degree. Uh -huh. Grandpa uh, Uriah, mother's stepfather, had remarried, as I said, and he had married, this is rather an interesting anecdote, he uh, wrote back to Tennessee and said, I am a widow with an 18-month-old son. I need a wife. And Grandma Emma got on the train and came out. He met the train in Flagstaff and took her to J.T.'s office, married her, and took her home. And they were a beautiful couple. They had no children, Grandpa. They raised Uncle Guy. And she was a housekeeper that would have made a scrub nurse looked dirty. She cleaned everything. And uh, so we, uh, we went from there. Daddy Bum worked, I called him Daddy Bum for a long time, worked for the Forest Service building the roads on the Mogollon Rim. So we camped all across northern Arizona. In that, well, the first summer, mother, the first winter, mother decided I didn't have to go to school. I'd made two grades, and she didn't want me graduating too young. So we, she took me with her that whole year. I had summer, winter, and summer, and I went to, to Bloody Basin. Okay. I rode burros. Oh, this was wonderful. I had learned to ride, or been on a horse when I was two, mother rode. But I was horse simple like you can't believe. So I got to ride a burro. I also fell off and got a bloody nose, but that doesn't count. And uh, uh, I met Granville Morris and Wendell to Spain there. They were kids. Uh, we, uh, Daddy stayed with the Forest Service and we moved. I went to Sedona School, I went to Kong King School, I went to Camp Verde School, I went to Clemenceau School. Just wherever he was moving, I moved. I think one, one year I moved six times. Wow. And it was okay. I had no trouble. And uh, the year I was in the sixth grade, the year I started uh, junior high, he said he quit. He had a wonder. He had been a, at one time a foreman for the CCCs when they were formed. And he had a position that was pretty well anchored. But he said to mother, she doesn't need to move. She's going into the upper grades. So he quit and went to work for Phelps Dodge. And he worked at Smelter in Clarkdale. And uh, the, I became somewhat familiar with the Smelter then because the half of the men that worked there were either breaking horses at home and working at the smelter, or farming at home and working at the smelter, because money was, it was good, but it was tight. 
it was just after the Depression, and money was hard to come by. During the Depression, I remember being the only child in my school who carried a regular lunch. The other kids were lucky if they had a fried egg and salt pork. Mm. And uh, so I divided. <laughs> that was one of the funniest things. The teacher caught us, wouldn't let me do it anymore. But it was almost pathetic. I got, mother couldn't, mother had Parkinsonism. So she couldn't do a lot of things. So I made my, or daddy or I made my sandwiches. I'd make a relish bread sandwich and I would carry a can of Vienna sausage and a cookie and a piece of fruit. And, and what was the, the, a relish what sandwich? Miracle Whip. Oh, Miracle Whip and, rel and relish. Oh, they used to make the most wonderful relish. You can't even buy it anymore. Okay. And uh, they put on white bread. <laughs> white bread. Well, you know, most people were eating biscuits then. Okay. Well, I got, I'd get to school and I opened my Vienna sausage with a key. This was in the fourth grade. And I'd start to pour this liquid out and one of the girls would say, no, no, wait a minute, and she'd get a cup and take the liquid from the vet. Well, that's the first time I knew that everybody didn't have this because we were, you know, nobody sat and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We just did what we did. And I had, it just wasn't observant. And she said, wait a minute, I want that liquid. And I said, why? I want to drink it. Why? I've never had a Vienna sausage. Mm. So I opened my can and gave her a Vienna sausage. She's your kidding. I said, no. And another little girl said, what makes her special? Mm. I think I ate one Vienna sausage that day. <laughs> it was all right. I wasn't hungry. And uh, the next day, Sox Brewer and Buzz, I don't know Sox's first name, but Buzz was Orlando, put a table up of an old door, and we had a, my very first um, potluck. Oh. Everybody put what they had out to eat, and they cut their sandwiches, and I had my first taste of a biscuit, salt pork, and scrambled egg sandwich. I'd never had that. And uh, when I cut my Vienna sausages in half this way and in half this way, <laughs> so they went around. And then we cut my white bread in eighths. And I thought it was great. It was so nice to have them like what I had. And the teacher found out about it and wouldn't let us do it anymore. Mm. She said the mothers would, my mother would raise cane. Well, my mother would not have raised cane. And my stepfather would have put an extra sandwich in. But, you know, who knows? You don't tell things always. But we went from this to smelter wages, and uh, they were good, but they weren't that good. And uh, I have to make a little side thing here. My father, until 29, when my mother divorced him in 27, she had 13 pair of shoes in her closet. Mm. And she went from that back, to, well, she'd grown up with dear mud, mud between her toes, she went back to it. And she never complained. I never heard my mother complain about that sort of thing. And uh, in fact, I can't remember her complaining about much of anything. And, uh, so Daddy went to work at the smelter, and then it was against the law 
but all of the smelter men would make um, take a ladle and drop it very gently into the boiling copper and jerk it up. Have you seen those bowls they made? We've seen ashtrays they made. Well, they're about the same thing. Yes. I had one I gave to my kids. I wish I'd brought, left it here for you to see. That was, they took a map of Arizona cast in steel and dropped it. And when it came up, it was a map of Arizona with the counties all in oh. lines in it. I was afraid somebody would like it. So I gave it to one of my kids. But uh, we had, those were, you got fired if you got caught, but they had a good value for trade when you got away from there. And uh, I, as I say, I, my mother, having been orphaned at 13 and making her own living, having everything, and then literally not having everything, when I was nine years old, my baby sister was born, and she was afraid that my stepfather would sit her on his daughter and I would be out in the cold. And she asked him, and he said, no. Sister's the oldest. She'll need more. That was the way it went till he died. Hmm. I was never anything but sister from then on. And when but mother said, he owes you nothing. My father was supposed to pay a child support, and my, it was pretty high priced. And my stepmother wrote him a letter and said, cut it in half at the time of the Depression. And he not only cut it in half, he cut it, period. And I got no more until I was in high school. And uh, mother, my mother said, you're going to be on your own. You better learn to pay for yourself. So I was babysitting by the time I was 13, 25 cents an hour and thinking I was getting rich. And I worked all through high school. I worked at various stores in Cottonwood. And uh, then I went to, as I say, to Clarkdale. And then when I graduated, I applied for a job at the school at the lower uh, lower Elementary. town, mm -hmm. and uh, got it. But I also had no car, and the wages weren't very... Oh, my stepfather was going to teach me to drive. I think he had hopes of getting me a car, but I was driving a Model A Ford, and I hit a lady, and I knocked the knee out of her knee action wheel, and it cost him oh. to get it fixed, so he couldn't quite get me a car yet, but I did have a horse I bought myself, and it was probably the most expensive horse I ever owned. It cost $25. Mm. But I was, I bought it when I was making 25 cents an hour. I have seldom bought a horse that I paid a hundred hours worth of paid wages for. <laughs> but I, I bought it. and. So when I got this job, I would get up and saddle my horse in Cottonwood and ride over to Butcherville, just below the school in Canterbury. Where in I, Clarkdale. At uh, Clarkdale, excuse me, where I knew a lady, and I would leave my horse in her fence patch. It wasn't a corral, just a fence patch, but with grass, and go into her house and put on hose and heels and walk over to the school at Lord. And I did this for a couple of months. What did you do at the school? What was your job? I was a secretary. Oh, okay. I, I was, uh, at that time, I had learned my secretarial skills at Clarkdale High. Mm -hmm. I could type about 45 words a minute and take shorthand of 150. Wow. So I was, got a job there. And I heard that they were looking for somebody at the smelter, so I applied. And I got a job at Feldstock Smelter 
in the safety and personnel office. My boss was see, Hardy, Jack Hardy and Paul Keefe. And Paul Keefe at that time was the president of the Arizona State Senate. Mm. And so we were, as you know, into World War II, just steps to it. I, we were. I graduated in 42. And as I recall, we got into war, it was in 41, was it not? It was, 41. And uh, so we were already having e pens for effort and, and so forth. And uh, so I was working at uh, the Clark, uh, Clarkdale when I met Walter and uh, Walter Kent. And he was a cowboy, and he owned a little bunch of cattle up on the side of Mingus, the W. Dark brand. And uh, he uh, joined the Navy. Well, he came back in uniform, and you know, uh, the way things were. I knew him from about, uh, Oh, maybe early fall till March, and we were married in March. And I was still working at Phelps Dodge when I married, and one of my co-workers was one of his girl, ex-girlfriends. Walter was 11 years older than I. And I would tell anybody, think twice, that's a, quite a step. It really is, because his friends were not the people I associated with. And he had no desire to associate with my friends. And uh, now he he worked at the smelter or not? He had worked at the smelter. Okay. He had also worked up on Giant's Grave when they had a, a fire station. Over. Right. Mm -hmm. And I had gone up there with another boyfriend, and so I had been up there where he had worked, but I didn't know that he had worked there until after we were married. And uh, after we, I guess, uh, about April or May, I decided I didn't want to be an absentee bride, so I, I'd been saving money pretty heavy because I planned to go to college. I had several war bonds, and I had a pretty good savings account. So I bought a ticket to San Diego. And I went to be a war bride in San Diego. And I lived there for two years. I lost my first child and had my oldest child there. My daughter says, well, I wasn't born in Arizona, but I was conceived there. <laughs> because we came back for, road, for road, Roundup every year. When he was shipped overseas, he finally, right at the end, he was on the USS Barataria. And uh, it was a torpedo ship. Barracaria? Uh-huh. Huh. He was an uh, aerial torpedo man. And uh, he went overseas. And I was at that time, he had moved me to El Cajon with his family. Mm. And uh, I just picked up my tricks and traps and came home. <laughs> okay. And uh, I bought a house and I rode on the W. Dark cattle and raised my daughter. And um, my friends came. I bought a cute little house, but my dear husband came home and decided he didn't want it. And he didn't even try to sell the equity. He just walked out. And where was the house? And well, we'd call it uh, Spelter City now. OK. <laughs> No, was it Smelter City? Yeah. Smelter City or Clemenceau, somewhere over there? Yeah, it was just outside of Cottonwood. Okay. And uh, he bought the slaughterhouse in the foothills of Jerome. And we, it took us two years to go broke. Oh. Uh, Norman Fane and Brooke. 
Wright, McCright, Mr. McCright from Phoenix, were our partners in the Smelter House. And when we went broke, they just, McCright especially, they just cleaned us up. We didn't even have a car to McCright. Wow. And I walked out with a milk cow, and that was only because I told them they better damn sure pay their insurance before they came and tried to get my cow. I, I, I sat there and took a beating until they tried to take my cow away from me. And I fought back, and I kept her. Kept her till she died. And um, in fact, I kept quite a few of her offspring, too, come to think of it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she had a calf every 11 months. So I stayed in Yelp pretty well. And uh, were you living at the sl slaughterhouse? Did you live up there or not? Oh, of course. Yes. So you lived and there. Shacks and God knows what all. Kind of camped up there. I learned to skin cold calves. I learned to braid treepus. I learned to run the sausage kitchen. I could cut down a carcass and help load it. Wow. And I, I, I did learn, uh, and I did the bookkeeping for a while. And then my brother-in-law got a divorce and brought his two sons and gave them to me to take care of and became our bookkeeper. So I did that until he remarried for one day and she took the kids and left. And it was a mess. Yeah. But anyway, Walter and I moved from there. We were going to go to work for Norman, who was my cousin. And he and Norman had a fight after I got half moved, and he informed me I had to move out. I was pregnant with my second child, so I went to my old friend Aunt Beth Seiler and rented a house in Clemenceau and uh, moved back there. And we lived in Clemenceau several months, and his brother, younger brother, wrote and said he was coming with his new bride, so we bought a house on the edge of Cottonwood in just between Mexican Town and Lower Town, or Main Street. Now, is that Cottonwood or, Co or Clarktail? Cottonwood. And Cottonwood. Where is Mexican Town and Cottonwood? Well, it was up on the ridge on the hill above between Cottonwood and Clemenceau. Okay, kind of where, across from the school. Where what? Across from the school. Across the road from the school. Yes, okay, I know. And uh, then they came down and they had a few houses on the gulch, and we had one of the houses on the gulch. And uh, we, Walter decided to do farming, so he went to work for Mr. Fuller, and we moved to Cornville. And from there on, we hopscotched all over the Verde Valley. Um, Walter had, been, had lived, he came into Arizona in 1924, which was when I was born, and they moved to Clarkdale. And they lived in Clarkdale for a year, and then his father worked for Phelps Dodge, and they got the uh, um, Haskell Ranch, and they moved out there, and the kids were all raised at Haskell until the war when they picked up and moved to El Cajon. Okay. So he was essentially a Clarkdale person and uh, knew everybody in Clarkdale. I think at one time he said he rode his horse into the pool room on Main Street in Clarkdale. <laughs> but uh, um, when uh, my daughter was ready to go to high college, we moved back to Flagstaff. And we were up there from 55 to 75. I got a divorce in that length of time. 
I moved back to the Verde in 75. Bought a house, bought a place in uh, Rimrock from the Mangini Selmas, and they were wonderful. And um, I still have it, in fact. Well, I don't. I gave it to my son because having a house and being here is a lot of red tape. Sure. So I gave it away. But it served its purpose. I remarried Walter uh, at the children's, we'll put it calmly and say request. Demand would be better. Uh, after being sent a divorce for several years, about 18, and um, took care of him until he died here at the home. I had to put him in the home because I could not take care of him. Yeah. And then I lived on the hill until I was 86. And I was injured. And they thought I was going to die. And, you know, tough old bird. I lived through it and came here. And that's where I am. And so you lived in Rimrock at the time. Yeah. When you say on the hill, you meant in Rimrock. Mm hmm. Yeah. It's up on the hill. Okay. Above. I could walk on my hill and look down and watch the trunks stagger out of the, the saloon down in, in McGuireville. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, it's been good. It's been a very different life. I ran the San Francisco Peaks Riding and Hunt Club in Flagstaff owned part of it. I taught horsemanship at NAU and I'm sorry to say that it was wonderful. I enjoyed every bit of it, but I should have finished it a little better than I did. I act, they did not know that I actually had a nervous breakdown. My daughter picked me up and moved me to Verde in 75. And I, nobody told the college. Oh. So that was really a no-no and a bad thing. But uh, the nine years prior to that, U of A took my program. It was that good. Wow, good. And uh, um, I taught horsemanship on private lessons oh, for years and years and years. And when I retired, or when I had that nervous breakdown, it came down. One of my students brought her horse, her husband and there, his horse, and said, you're going to give us a lesson? And I said, no, I'm not. I quit. She said, well, what's for supper? <laughs> I said, what? She said, we're staying till we get our lesson. So I went back to teaching again. My daughter has taken it up, and she's an exceptionally good teacher. And uh, what is your daughter's name? Sherry. D E capital D E capital B I L L I E R. She uses Sherry Kent de Villiers. And it's Sherry S H. E R R Y. Okay. Sure. And uh, she's seventy four, and still winning ribbons, riding barrel races. Wow. My oldest son was Walter Norman Kent, and is Norman Walter Norman Kent, I shouldn't say was. And he became a petroleum geologist. He has been, he worked in uh, Alaska for I think it was 17 years, discovered one of the biggest uh, oil production mines up there. After Bruto Bay, it was the next one, just went over, and its output was comparable. And uh, then he went to um, Syria, he lived in Syria with his wife and children for two years, two and a half years. Came back and 
worked in the States, but he traveled. And he has, I probably won't get them all, but he has had jobs in China, in India, in Iraq. I, he's been in Iran, but not technically. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. I just, he, uh, he worked for the State Department as a geologist during the Iranian conflict when his son was sent. He has two sons, both of them are in the ROTC and both have worked, one of them is still in the ROTC and he's a major. I do not know whether the oldest one is or not, but I presume he is. And uh, my next son is a um, cowboy and he has been a cow, uh, manage, ranch manager and now is currently working for Babbitts. And my third son was a self-employed self-contractor and a top-notch carpenter and builder. I also helped raise two of my, three of my grandchildren. One of them is a spectacular builder, a real unusual person. And one is back working cattle. And my granddaughter is in, my oldest granddaughter is in Oklahoma, married, has children, ranch. Um, they're scattered. Mm. Yeah. And uh, my oldest great grandchild is here in Prescott, visits me a couple of times a month at least. She's only 27. Mm. Great granddaughter. Well, it sounds like you've had a and I have Wonderful. another great grandchild that is due on the way now. Oh my goodness! So it's been a, they say it's a long road with no turning. I agree. There's been a lot of turns. I've been should we say financially stable, and I've been pretty cotton picking poor and. Uh, never seemed to bother me much either way. You know, <laughs> you do what you have to do. And I have worked at probably, let me see, we start with babysitting, we go to secretary, we go to cow punching, we go to um, well, no, I left out the dime store and working for a furniture store and an ice cream parlor, too. <laughs> and uh, I have uh, worked for the adjustment agency for insurance. I have worked for um, Northern Arizona Gas. I have worked for uh, Monte Vista Hotel. I was a waitress. I learned, was taught waiting tables by two very good uh, Harvey girls before I got married. And it's always come in handy. You can always get a good job if you can wait tables. <clears throat> and uh, I've been head waitress. I have uh, owned an employment agency and owned part of a Hunt Club, own my own uh, writing academy. So, you know. <laughs> You've done it all. Go from Heather to Yon. <clears throat> uh, I actually cow punched for wages during the war, or right after the war when we couldn't get anybody. I schooled horses for money and <clears throat> taught riding lessons. And uh, I never cleaned house for wages. That's one of the few things. It was all 
all I could do to keep my own clean with what I did. <clears throat> and I didn't always. What about Yavapai College? Hmm? You left out Yavapai College. Yes, I taught uh, 20 years at Yavapai College for knit, tat, and crochet. And I'm still teaching people to knit, and tat, and crochet if they want to learn. <laughs> and uh, there was a they asked me to list all of them for Yavapai College. I was picked as Woman of the Year one year. And my list was about three inches long under my picture. <clears throat> so, and all the width of it. So, I've left out a score. But every time my husband moved, he would say, quit your job, I need you. I've worked on the combine, I've sewed sacks, I've uh, you driven worked. truck. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an idea. Now this is terribly funny. While we were at the slaughterhouse, I was in the office. My husband called me. He said, Betty, I'm at the Thane Ranch in uh, Lonesome Valley. He said, uh, bring the cattle truck. I just bought some cattle and come on over. I said, Walter, I have never driven that cattle truck. And I've never driven over Mingus Mountain. He said, get Frankie to fix that. It was a two gear shift. To set one gear shift, okay. The other you can drive. And drive it one gear curve at a time and come on. <laughs> so I did. I mean, this is the way my life ran. I never knew today what I might do tomorrow. But that was okay. I had fun. There's a piece of my tatting up there. Oh, beautiful. Wow. That's gorgeous. And uh, <clears throat> I have uh, worked for the fair. I've I helped found in the Africos. Mrs. Sides and I were on the Constitution Committee. Um, you, I helped you helped found, what was it? What? The Africos in Flagstaff. It's a theater group. Oh, okay. And I helped, uh, I found, helped found, was founding chairman and president of the Northern Arizona Horsemen Association which still functions, um, you know, yeah. whatever came up. And uh, incidentally, my hunt club, we changed the name to High Country Hounds, and I believe it still functioned. And uh, wonderful people. And uh, that was not chasing foxes, we chased coyotes. Hmm. And I want to tell you something. Those coyotes are smarter than a fox. Hmm. <clears throat> and they would come and ask to be run. Thumb hmm. their noses at us, so to speak. And uh, it was just in our hunt club days, we had red coats and hunting caps and English saddles and the whole bit. Jumped fences and so forth and so on. But uh, that was that day too. You know, so. Uh, you did it all. Well, I haven't, but I sure made a try at it. <laughs> <clears throat> I. Uh, I have regrets, but they aren't enough to cripple me. And I have memories that uh, they just don't come that way anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, I rode with a hunter, huntsman on the hunt club in, uh, Oh boy, I'm near Denver. What was the town? Anyway, 
Mr. Wright, bless his heart, gave me a mare that nodded. And at the end of the day, he said, I have ridden on four continents, and I've never ridden with anyone with any better hands than you have. <laughs> Boy, I'm telling you, I walked on the air for five days. Dan Thane said, Betty, I'll punch, I'll ride the river with you any day when I was punching cattle. I walked on the air for 10 days after that. <laughs> so, you know, I have good memories. They're, uh, some of them are funny. The reason I got the compliment from Dan Granville, he would have socked you for that. He liked to be called Dan. Uh, he was married to my grandmother's, grandfather's niece. But uh, Walter and I came over, came home from the Navy to uh, go through Roundup. And I was riding a really superb little half Arab horse, half bar. And uh, we gathered cattle that day. And he uh, a pretty good sized herd, right in the middle of what is now Prescott Valley. I could see that hill. Oh dear, I won't be able to say it. We called it Old Baldy. And uh, now it is, has a high class name. <coughs> and uh, he said to me, you'll hold the yearling cut. Why, I'd never held any cut. I was really, I'd never been around a big cow ranch. So I'm trying to hold the regular cut, the regular herd, and the yearling cut. I went and got it. This yearling, they cut to me and stopped it. Went back to the herd and Bill Graham, who was riding with us, said, Betty, you stay with the yearlings. Okay. Hmm. Well, normally when they hold a yearling cut. They cut a cow and a calf, so the yearlings are less trotty. Dan didn't do that. He cut me out five yearlings, just biff, bam, biff, bam. And I did some plain and fancy riding. I was riding a horse I could do it with, but I held him. And later he told me that he was quite impressed. So was I, much more than he. <laughs> and uh, laughed, told my husband, he said to me, what Dickinson are you? I said, Walter. He said, Opal? I said, yeah. You the Siwash? <laughs> I said, yes so. He said, oh my God. Laughed. He later told my husband he better handle me with care. My mother's temper was pretty well known. <laughs> but uh, she, as I say, she was a beauty queen and she could afford to have a temper. I was just a little old brat. No. Growing up, I couldn't afford to have a temper. Well, sounds like a wonderful life and and Thank you so much for telling all these stories. Well, I'll tell you quite honestly, I am writing my memoirs. Good. And I have the first 30 minutes or 15 minutes of our talk has take, takes over 100 pages, which we never get written, read in 15 minutes. And some of the stories are pretty good. And. Uh, I am hoping to get it finished and publish it before I kick with the bucket. I won't make any promises. Incidentally, when I in eighteen in nineteen eighty, I was working at the college and I bought my first computer. Oh, good. And took. Um, and the keyboard. No, yeah. Oh, uh, created. I took. Uh, Processing, word processing at the uh -huh. college. <clears throat> oh. 
my son Norman taught me all about the tree and the branches and so forth. And I almost learned it. And then I bought a new computer and I had to learn all over again. I phoned eight. And this one I've got now and I are just getting to be friends. <laughs> but the kids bought me Dragon two years ago where I could talk to it. And now I'm using uh, Office 365 where you talk to a microphone and you don't have to type. Oh. It's great. And uh, the only trouble is their vocabulary and mine. I don't think they ever heard of castorating a calf. <laughs> so, you know, I never did castrate a calf. I castrated a lot of, of goats and a couple of cats, but that's the end of it. But uh, I doctored a lot that were. Mm -hmm. And uh, silly part of this all is that when I work with the livestock, I can give the shot. It doesn't bother me. I fill a needle and get the air out. Get it. I don't give intravenous, I give sub Q. But uh, you walk in that door with a needle and I'll be out that window. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot tolerate a needle. For on yourself. On me. Yeah, that's right. Give it to me and I'll show you how it's done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I guess that's kind of the story of my life. Oh, it's wonderful. As long as, as, long as I'm not getting jabbed with a needle, I can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wow. Well, anything, uh, do you think you have it all there? <laughs> It's all on here. Okay. I think it's one of the best ones we've ever had. Have I disappointed you? No. Oh, oh my no. goodness. I, I'm hoping that I can get all the names typed correctly without too many uh, boo-boos, but I'll, I'll listen to the tape again. Bring them back and we'll do it again. Yeah, well, I may have to, <laughs> I may have to come back and just clarify names with you once I we'll get, get it that. typed. Anytime. Sure. Well, we'll... Um, We'll go home and I will listen to the tape. I, I wear headphones and then I type what you said from the tape. You really ought to get. Well, I, you know, <laughs> it's, it's funny. I've tried that where you speak, but there, it doesn't break at all. There's no, they don't put the punctuation in. And I found it to be very... Um, you say it. You, you say it, I know, but you have to say the period and say the question mark while well, I just, uh, I'd rather type. <laughs> oh, she's lucky. <laughs> she's a very good, <clears throat> good typist. Once I would have rather, but my hands aren't as clever as they once were. Well, I, you know, I can, I'm not the world's best typist, but I can go back, I, I can watch when I'm typing and usually pick up my mistakes and go back, but. You know, I can type without, look, I'm not a hunt and peck typer. Oh, no. Which would take forever. You'd never get it done. No. I think I'm going to stop the uh, okay. taping here and... Okay. Uh,